Hi, everybody. It is our pleasure to restart the MOCO seminar series after summer break. Thanks for different groups uh, at MPI who are involved in MOCO committee and prepare the complete schedule for the following uh, six months. This week, Jinyu Zhu, uh, the representative from Zopping Lens Group, is our host. We would, he would introduce our guest. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so um, uh, today, um, Professor Li Zhaoping invites Professor Patrick Kavanagh as our MOCO speaker. And on behalf of Zhaoping, it's my great honor to be the host and introduce Professor Kavanagh before the talk. Um, so um, Dr. Kavanagh graduated in communications engineering from McGill University in 1968. He then obtained a PhD in cognitive psychology from Carnegie Mellon in 1972. After that, he has worked in University de Montreal, Harvard University, University of Paris, Descartes, Dartmouth College, and Gleason College. At Harvard, along with Ken Nakayama, Professor Kavanagh founded the Fashion Sciences Laboratory in 1990. In 2007, he won a Chef d'Excellence for his uh, outstanding works on facial attention at the, the University of Paris, Descartes. Currently, he is a research professor at Dartmouth College and a senior research fellow at Gladen College of York University. So Patrick described himself as an academic transient However, I would rather say he's like a lighthouse in science, as he gifted us a massive of brilliant and inspiring works in facial illusions, attention, color, motion perception, and so on, since 1970s already. For example, when I was um, um, in university, I was once impressed by his paper about attentional based motion perception in a journal club already. And then just a few years ago, I was fascinated again by his talk about sufficient science behind the light and the shadows in artworks. So recently, um, Professor Kavanagh's group has found some more fascinating illusions, a flash grab illusion and double drift illusion. So today he will share with us the insights into position coding in the brain from this interesting facial phenomenon. So let's welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jin Yu. That was very kind. And it's a real pleasure to be back in uh, Tübingen, even if only by uh, uh, Zoom. Uh, someday I will be back for real, that would be nice. Um, let me start these uh, slides now. And um, there'll be two parts because there's a lot of motion um, examples. Uh, it's not just these slides. There, there will be the motion um, videos on the slides, but the, uh, they of course in Zoom don't work very well. So if you look in your chat window, you should see uh, a link and that's the link to some movies. Now you click on them uh, it'll take a few seconds, maybe a minute to open, and it'll start with just two movies. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about how to use those movies in a moment. So let's get going. And, and we'll start getting your movies. Okay, first of all, for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with Zoom that much, you need to press the um, escape key or double click on my slide here or there's a couple other ways, but you want to exit the full screen. You don't want my slides taking up your whole screen. So you can <clears throat> check your email in the back or whatever you like to do. But also that'll give you a chance to see the movies as a second screen. Okay, let's get some going. Now, I, I believe it's not true for everybody set up, but I believe down below on your uh, uh, window now it is a little uh, chat. So that's where you go to find that um, address I put up. And I'll be putting it up a few times because anyone who comes a bit later, uh, their, their chat window will be refreshed and it won't be there. 
Okay, so you should double click on the address in the window and have your uh, movies going. Um, and when you do, uh, or, or if that didn't work, here's the address down here. Sorry, you'd have to type that in if that didn't work uh, to get those movies going. Okay. Now, uh, when you have the movies, let me just, just to navigate them, uh, most of them, uh, the movie will start on its own, but after only a few seconds, so you have to be a bit patient. Uh, but you can navigate by clicking on the top of the window, you know, sort of up on the top edge of the window, and then use your right and left arrow keys on your keyboard to move forward and backward. Uh, or you can click on the movies, or you can probably discover other ways. And if you click on them, you'll also see the uh, full screen if you want to look at it full screen. Uh, other way to navigate is if you take your cursor and move to the edge of your movie screen, not this one here, but your movie screen, you'll see all of the slides, all of the movies show up and you can click on them as you wish in turn. Okay, so uh, if you have any trouble with movies, let me know while we're talking and, and uh, we'll make sure they get to work for you. Okay, so what are we gonna do today? We're gonna look at um, uh, uh, something uh, maybe new for many of us, some of us. So much of vision research deals with what things are in the ventral stream and um, you know, recognizing faces and letters and uh, objects in the world. Uh, but of course, the dorsal stream is the where pathway and we're gonna track that pathway way up into the frontal lobes. So, uh, I want you to think that uh, where is perhaps the more um, fundamental aspect of vision. So sometimes we see things, we don't know what they are, but we know where they were, but then the reverse is never true. We don't ever see things and they have no location. I mean that, so the location is kind of the matrix in which our vision takes place and uh, any new ways to understand how it works is a real insight, real opening to the functioning of vision. So how do we know where things are? Uh, well, for decades, we of course thought that receptive fields, or many of us felt the receptive fields were the code for location. Um, up here is the, you know, some stimulus on the, ooh, that's nice, some stimulus on a screen. And, it follows through the visual system. And here we're recording from a receptive field and that receptive field only responds to items to stimuli within this small local area. So every receptive field is really an implicit code or explicit code, sorry, for where things are. And you might think that that's, well, that's it. But in fact, it isn't because uh, the brain is much smarter than that and certainly uses the receptive field uh, locations as a starting database. Um, <clears throat> uh, there we go, uh, starting database. Um, but it's not really that, it's not enough when a target is moving. When your eyes are moving or a target is moving, then things will be moving on your retina and the retinal location will be quickly out of date. Quickly, by quickly, I mean like about uh, um, a tenth of a second. You might not think a tenth of a second as much, but when it's you're playing tennis like uh, like uh, Medvedev and Djokovic were yesterday, or uh, or the women's final the day before, tenth of a second can be as much as uh, you know three meters, even ten meters, uh, for a tennis ball. And then if you're driving a car, of course, and people will be completely out of place as you try to navigate through a busy intersection. So uh, our neural uh, activity takes a while to reach awareness. So we live a tenth of a second in the past, we might think based on that, but in fact, the brain goes and uses that motion, which is to in some sense the problem, it uses the motion as a solution and uses it to predict where things might be, predict where our, our eyes might be. Uh, and that's kind of called uh, constructing. So we construct where things are, just like we might construct the colors in a scene. Many of you know about uh, color constancy. So Here's a classic uh, little example where there's a sort of a red illumination here and a greenish one there. And our brain has automatically um, compensated for the apparent illumination. So this corner of this cube has in fact the same wavelengths and strengths coming to you from the screen as this one. These two are identical, uh, but our vision has discounted the illuminant. 
those who do social psychology also understand this in the sense of the, the discounting context to recover intentions. Anyways, a widespread strategy in the brain. Here's a little, uh, just to show you that these two portions are the same um, uh, values of the uh, wavelengths coming from the screen. Okay, so we can discount uh, illuminate to get um, uh, color, color in the scene, but we can also discount an object's motion or perhaps it's background motion if our eyes are moving to predict where it is now. So that's the idea is we're gonna do, we're gonna try and un, unravel, uh, unpack how the brain is making sense of a moving and dynamic scene. Uh, and doing that, we hope to understand how position is coded and what, what is where. Okay, so we're gonna look at three illusions. We did mention illusions, Jin Yao. And uh, yes, um, some of us think, well, why don't we just study vision? Why bother with illusions? They're lots of fun to look at. But they, what, what have they ever done for us? Well, actually they've done quite a bit. So that's, that's why we're gonna focus on three of them here. First of all, the mechanism of the illusion um, helps us understand how the process is working. So uh, understanding illusions for themselves is not a, a sort of a lost uh, effort. But also it tells us about anatomy. We can find out where this processing happens. So this is this is the unique and interesting part, and this will come up later in our second part. Uh, I mean, what's the point? And the point is the image on the retina, let's call it the bottom up uh, 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 information, um, travels through the visual system. And at some point, in the in case of an illusion, and only an illusion, that representation changes. And now it has some higher level representation that doesn't match the bottom up. And if we track the information through the visual system from bottom up until the percept, we, where it changes, that's where perception happens. So uh, we can uh, get quite uh, a good step forward in understanding perception, and in this case, uh, location perception by looking at these illusions. Now this to me, oh, this is Rafa Nadal. So he didn't make it into the final at all. He didn't even play. Uh, in the tournament, but uh, here he is. He's a, an amazing tennis player, uh, but actually most tennis players will do this. Look at his eyes watching the ball. So this isn't on the uh, special demos because even if you see it kind of slowly, it's fine. Notice how he tracks the ball. So that's what you have to do in order to hit it properly. Uh, and I think, like, well, okay, so look at him. Ooh, well, 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 again, we're looking at him right there. Okay, so his eyes are dead on that ball. Now remember, the, the neural activity only reaches awareness a tenth of a second later. So is this like a zombie? How can he be seeing anything? He's really, he's predicted, his eyes have predicted exactly where the ball is based on information from a tenth of a second ago. And a tenth of a second ago, the ball was like way over here somewhere, three, three meters away. I think this was a 30 meter a second uh, uh, um, uh, shot. So, so a tenth of a second ago, some information he picked up while well, he was looking down there, have got his head here. And so that idea of prediction, of course, is behind a lot of what the brain does. That's why we managed to survive. And the idea is that perhaps our perception is also, I mean, he's not looking at blank space and he's not seeing what was there 10 second, a tenth of a second ago. He's undoubtedly seeing the ball right in front of his nose. Otherwise he'd be saying, well, it's kind of like alien hand. My eyes were there, but I don't know why. So. There's some amazing um, processing going on here. And um, we're gonna try and understand it in three steps. And the first step is uh, just the idea that motion itself, we'll call it simple motion, uh, engages this in uh, uh, prediction ahead along the path of motion, what, what uh, Rafa, Nad Rafa Nadal was doing there. So many people have studied this from uh, flash lag and before motion can make a target appear ahead of its actual position on a path. Now, if you go to your web movie, you'll see two examples of that. And uh, Romy Nijiwan uh, was maybe the first to propose that that um, extrapolation was to allow you to see the present, to actually predict where something is now and experience it there. And Hinzo Hohendorn has sort of reviewed all that just uh, last year. So in the first movies, uh, so which I'll have here as well, uh, the first one on the left is the uh, from Devaloy and Devaloy, and also Ramachandran and Anstis. So let's call it a motion drag. Now, if you on yours um, movie, you click on the top part to make it go, and then well, maybe maybe the 
Hello, come in. Mine isn't starting. Oh, there it goes. Nope, I went too far. I'm having trouble with mine already. Uh, so I'm using a navigation. I'm back to the first one. I press the right key. Ah, okay. Now I got the motion drag going. And what you should see, and I think you'll notice, uh, I can't tell from here, but I think you'll notice on the Zoom version that it's kind of jerky, but on the web version, it should be nice and smooth. You see the top two getting closer and farther and closer relative to the bottom two. And that's the motion. Now, none of those little patches are actually moving. It's the texture within them they're moving. Uh, <coughs> and uh, 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 the motion you get here, the offset between the top and the bottom Gabor is about uh, maybe a quarter of the order of the Gabor size itself. That's called motion drag, or we like to call it motion drag. On the right of that, if you uh, click your, um, uh, I'm looking over here because that's where my movies are. If you, on the right of that, the uh, flash lag example, if you're looking at the center, uh, let me make my, this version go here. If you're looking at the center dot, the uh, two little red triangles flash when they're actually adjacent to the edge. And yet you may see the edges being um, sort of uh, beyond, being ahead of, and that flash lag got its name from that. Okay. Um, a second example, this is Stuart Ansis and myself, and you can get to your second web movie, you should say web movie number two now. And you should see these uh, red and green bars flashing that are vertical, I'll make it work here, but of course it'd be very, uh, jumpy on your on the regular slides, but on the, the uh, uh, web version, you should see the these bars tilting out and in by quite a bit. So the the experience of the red bar here and the the green bar there. Do I have them the right way around? Hang on. Oh, the yeah, red bar here, green bar there. Every now and then, the background goes away to show you that it's not the not the computer program; it's your brain. Uh, so the ends of the red and green bars are, you know, many bar widths away, or at least two or three for me, from their uh, from their physical location on your retina. And the idea is that the well, the retina green bars themselves don't move, but interestingly, because they flash at the same time as the motion reverses direction, uh, magically they got bound to the motion, and they get, the visual system is assuming they are moving, and and sort of posts their position where it would be had they kept moving for that 10th of a second delay. Uh, and that's the explanation that we like for, for, these, uh, um, for these effects, uh, which are quite large, I think you'll agree. Or this next one, um, if you go to web movie number three, uh, also done with uh, Stuart Anstis, um, you should see this uh, blue and red square. Uh, where's the blue square looks quite big and thick on the edges and the red square looks small, but they are physically identical. So there's absolutely no change in size or width uh, between the two, but the motions of the background are sort of pull the uh, blue one out and then squeeze the red one back. Again, the red and the blue aren't themselves moving, but because they flash at the same time as there's a motion transient, they sort of get bound to the motion and the visual system um, constructs their location as it would be a tenth of a second later. Um, okay, so I think that makes the point that we don't always see things where they are on their on the retina, you know, on a location that would correspond to where they are on the retina. I'm trying to turn off my little my movie over here. Uh, okay, I think I did. That's a bit annoying. Okay, so extrapolates. So somehow the visual system constructs, is trying to be helpful, uses the motion of an object to extrapolate to where it will be. Um, and the position offsets are useful because that helps to get them to where they physically are. And, um, and this has been well established in physiology uh, for eye movements in, in um, uh, frontal eye fields. Uh, uh, Carlos Casanello and uh, Vince Ferrara uh, and co-authors show the third of the cells in the frontal eye fields code for the landing location. In other words, they've, they've already predicted where the object is going to go um, and, and um, program the SCAD to its location, its end location, um, which is quite far from its current retinal location. 
and a similar result from the spirit clitless uh, uh, more recently. So here are the three uh, commonly you know, spun live field, and the F kind of fell off there. The, uh, the IPS and the spirit clitless. Yes, I think I had a font change mess there. Okay. Uh, and you also see this in area V4, oh, area A, sorry, I was missing A there, of the visual cortex. Christy Sundberg, uh, Maz Fala, and uh, John Reynolds uh, showed that when a, a target is moving into a visual, into a receptive field in V4, um, this cell, these cells were not interested in the motion itself. They were only interested in the color. So that it moves towards the, the target uh, receptive field uh, and it's gray, but just before it gets there or while it's there, it flashes blue, which is one of the cell's preferred colors. And when it does that, the cell will respond earlier if the motion is towards the receptive field than it is if it's away. So again, it's doing uh, an extrapolation uh, here in V4. Okay, so this is all uh, pretty well established. Now, if you think about it for a moment, and I, I'm sure you have, um, that the, uh, the, the perceptual extrapolation, seeing things ahead of where they are, uh, is there in one, sense to help uh, saccades land on targets to know where the targets should be, uh, then you might think people with slow saccades would have a bigger, a bigger perceptual effect. So if I'm a you know, slower saccading person, I would need to extrapolate my targets further for them to be in the proper place for uh, saccades to land. And that's what uh, L. Van Heusen showed. She showed that across people, the longer the saccadic latency, the larger the perceptual shift. And she used, uh, well, you know, something like this. They measured, she measured where saccades would land, and saccades do show this error. They, they go to the uh, error or prediction. They go not to where the, the retinal location was of the flash, but they go to its perceived location. And um, subjects that had slower saccades had a larger, both a larger saccade offset error if you wish, and also a larger perceptual offset, so that it does seem to have a link to the saccad system. So the conclusion of this first part, simple motion perception, attention, I didn't really tell you much about that, and eye movements all show a similar extrapolation for simple motion. So this seems to be built in, you know, let's use the predictive powers of the brain, things are moving, we know, we can tell where they should be in about a tenth of a second, and let's do that. And they all, uh, all of these three uh, systems predict a shift of forward at about 100 milliseconds, plus or minus some. Uh, and by saying it's 100 milliseconds means if we make the stimulus go twice as fast, the perceptual shift is twice as far. Now, based on all this, we thought the saccade system might be our source of um, the, you know, the code, the code for location that the saccade system is doing this. We can show it physiologically. And maybe maybe that's that's it. You know, it wasn't receptive fields, it was more than that. Maybe it's what the saccade system computes. But we were wrong. So the second part here is about the double drift. Now this has been called uh, infinite regress when Peter T first discovered it uh, with um, uh, uh, Brown Say um, in 2006. And it was called the curveball illusion by Art Shapiro in 2010, uh, but we'd like to change the name. So now it's the double drift. And you, you get it uh, on your web, web movie number four. If you start that, make sure it's running. When I look away, I'm looking at my web again, my web version. Okay, so you're looking at the, the black fixation spot and you might see that uh, moving uh, Gabor pattern is uh, moving up and maybe straight up or maybe tilted to the right a bit. However, if you go and take a look at it directly, you see it's tilted, no, it's tilted obliquely. And the, uh, interestingly, the offset now between the, the physical location up here, the endpoint, and the perceived location over here is now like three or four times the width of the, of the Gabor, rather than the quarter the width of the Gabor that Devoloy and Devoloy got when they did exactly the same thing, but the, uh, the, the Gabor was stationary with the motion inside. So something happens when the, the Gabor starts to move and everything breaks down. And the um, this shift, which was small in the original Devoloy, the motion drag Devoloy and Devoloy, just keeps on accumulating for a long time, seconds. 
and gets quite large. Um, so, oops, sorry, keep clicking on the wrong window. Here we go. However, there's something really unexpected here. And so I think I lost a, uh, um, I lost a uh, bet of a bottle of champagne or something. It was in France. Uh, because we thought, of course, the saccades will go to where the um, illusion was, just like they did for the uh, flash grab. And, you know, you, you, you would target the perceived location. Why would you ever not do that? But in this case, you don't. So the drift is uh, double drift affects perception uh, dramatically, but not gaze. So here, this is with Matteo Lisi, who's now at the University of uh, Exeter. And um, this is uh, his, uh, one of his first um, studies when he joined our lab in Paris. And he, he did the same thing kind of you saw before. There's a tilted uh, path in the, uh, well, actually it's tilted this way. And the um, illusion made it appear vertical. And all he did was ask you, okay, uh, when the fixation point dims, please make a saccade to the um, target. Just as soon as you can, make a saccade. Uh, well, first of all, he did a control. Here's that path, tilted off to the right. Uh, no motion in the uh, in the um, in the uh, the bore itself. Internal motion, and here are the landing points of all the, the saccades that were triggered by the you know, dimming fixation point. The saccades started from over about here, and notice they all fall short. So that's a common property of saccades uh, that they undershoot. That's that's nothing special, uh, but notice that the the um, regression through the landing points is pretty parallel to the physical one. Okay, well now what happens when you do the illusion case is quite different. So now the physical uh, path again is this gray bar, but the perceived path is vertical. So CAD landings though are indistinguishable from the control case. So the, the so CAD system does not see this illusion. That means you have two as many people have claimed, two uh, visual systems. One that uh, is involved in saccades and is an illusion immune, or at least for this one, it wasn't. It was illusion susceptible for the flash grab. So saccades go to the physical path unaffected by illusion, and that opens up a lot of interesting uh, opportunities. Uh, now, just to characterize the double drift, it's a sideways shift. The target's moving up. Uh, or a mirror and the internal motion makes it shift sideways and it just keeps adding on a little bit at a time, adds on, staying from starting from its original, from its current location, uh, seconds of accumulation, uh, which is an unheard of amount of accumulation in vision. I think the shepherd tone is maybe a, uh, an equivalent example in audition, but in vision, very few things accumulate for more than about 100 milliseconds. Uh, so unlike the first one, that um, the flash grab, where things are, are shifted a bit in front of themselves and they're moving position, that's helpful. Here we have some uncorrected, uncalibrated uh, glitch that seems to happen strangely for this unusual stimulus, where the stimulus is moving and the internal texture is moving. So perception shifts, but the eye movements and attention do not. And I'll get into that a little bit more later. So, well, that made us revise everything and, and suggest that locations from the eye movement system, the CAD system, are not the final stage of the location code. There's something a lot, there's a lot more going on. And we're gonna be able to track this down now. Um, and what we're gonna find is uh, final stage is outside the visual system. There's an exclamation point. Um, now, I was advised by people a lot wiser than I am. And in a talk, you only use one exclamation point at most. But not only was it outside the visual system, it's in the frontal lobes. Okay, so you get two exclamation points there. So that, we'll, we'll go see where the evidence for that is and then uh, think about that for a moment. Now, first evidence that it wasn't in the visual field came from uh, optical encodings uh, with Sandrine Kemla and Fredo Chavan and Marseille. And, um, this was a test with only one monkey, but I'll show you what happened. It was only one monkey because we thought, oh, well, there's nothing going on here. And then we realized later that, that it was quite important that there's nothing going on. So there's a little window in the, over the monkey's V1, uh, a bit down to, and to the left of the foveal uh, representation. 
And uh, here will be the activity from the camera uh, when in the Gabor, this is the illusion case. And this one here will be the control case, uh, same, same path, but without the internal motion. And over here, we're gonna plot the midpoint, the centroids of each of these, because they're very fuzzy and blobby things. And I didn't make a movie for this because I think even with the, the poor rendition, it's going to be okay. Okay. Oh, it doesn't repeat. Let me repeat it. I forgot about that. Uh, so it goes up and to the left. Um, and the red and the, I'm sorry, the black and the white points follow this, the midpoints. Here's the black is going up here and the white is going up there. And here's a trace of all the, those centroids over time. And uh, I think you can see they're pretty similar. Um, Here's the control. Now, if the illusion followed the amount of illusion we expected for the stimulus presented here, it would have followed this path here, but it doesn't. So clearly, there's no effect of the illusion on the activity path in D1. So that, whereas uh, we hadn't run um, uh, fMRI on the flash grab, uh, the previous uh, illusion I described to you. And it showed very good, nice activity in V1, showing the shifts already in V1. And, and uh, Guh et al. also did a, a similar study. Okay, so how could that possibly be? You know, you're perceiving it over here. You would think that it, your attention to this uh, stimulus, perceived location of stimulus, would have downward projections to the um, V1 throughout everywhere in the visual system, saying, hang on. Here's where I expect the stimulus. Uh, please uh, improve uh, performance at these locations. But we don't see that. There are no downward projections of attention to V1 to the expected. That didn't happen. One possibility is attention, like saccades, may be immune to the illusion. Mm, so that might suggest that attention isn't really yoked to perception, but is yoked to uh, the eye movement system. And there are, of course, many uh, papers and proposals that attention and eye movements are linked in a number of ways. But, okay, forget that for the moment. That's interesting. Um, well, don't forget it. I mean, keep that in mind. If attention is not going to the perceived location, now at last we have a free hand to go find where um, perception emerges because the attention is not going to be projecting it. Uh, perceptual location everywhere, it's not going to be confusing us. And the downward projections, perhaps for this solution, go to the physical path. So they're kind of out of the way. They're going to go where the bottom up information is. And that means we can now find out where perception emerges because we'll, the early levels of the visual system will not be contaminated by this attentional system uh, projecting to expected locations. It seems not to be doing that. Well, the optical imaging you just saw reflects blood oxygenation like fMRI. So we moved on to some fMRI with the Surrey Liu and Qin Yu and Peter Tsi. Uh, pretty simple. So we have the stimulus going up and down, but its internal motion go one way in one condition, go the other way. So you see it tilted left or right. So you, you see it left or right tilt, even though the physical path is the same in both ways. So we're gonna do uh, decoding, which means we look at the activity of uh, the voxels in this area. Well, we know that it's going left. Let's say we take 90% of the trials and we know it's going left. We look at that activity pattern. And then we take the other 90, sorry, well, 45% left, 45% right. And we know that's going right. And so we can uh, teach an um, algorithm to discriminate optimally between left and right um, uh, trials where I perceive left and perceive right. And then we test the remaining 10%. And then we do it all over again by scrambling, which is our 90%, which is our test 10%. And we have these ROIs, which we got, got with little you know, flickering uh, versions of the paths for V1, V2, V3, and MT. And what can we do? Well, in V1, we can't do anything. There is no signal uh, corresponding to the leftward or the rightward tilt of the stimulus in V1. Uh, so replicating the, the monkey result. V2 and V3, there is some decoding. We think it's because of the local motion. Um, we're not so sure. And T again is not very good, but look what happens when we, um, oops, hang on, there we go. Look what happens when we decode the physical path. 
So uh, let's have a, a actual path, actual Gavor moving to the left and moving to the right. And let's match this angle to the, the, the subject's reported perceived angles here. So we're looking at the same angle in both cases. And we're going to do the decoding of leftward versus rightward tilts. And uh, well, I mean, this shows you that if V1 had any path that matched the physical path, it would have been super easy to pick up with this technique. And it didn't, okay, because it's just this very strong differences. They just don't show up here. Okay, that's, that's pretty interesting. But here's the more interesting one. We're going to do a whole brain searchlight MVPA. That means you take a little patch of the brain at a time and we do that decoding technique. Let's train on one versus the other and then test on uh, um, when we don't know uh, which is whether it's leftward or rightward. Um, but we're doing cross decoding. That means we're going to train on the, the physical shift. So we train on here's a real rightward, here's a real leftward. And now we can use all of them, okay? Because so we're going to train on the, the physical ones. And then we're going to test on the illusory shift. Remember, the illusory shift looks to perception to be the same as the, as the physical one. Remember, the physical one has no internal motion. The illusory one is moving vertically, but has an internal motion that makes it look rightward tilt or leftward tilt. Okay, so what happens when we train on physical and test on illusory? And of course, we do the reverse as well. What does that mean to do that? Well, the successful cross decoding indicates you found a location where there's a common representation for both illusory and physical paths. That means that's the location where perception lies because that's where they are the same. These are matched perceptually. And we can find out where that happens. Okay, reveal where perception emerges. So where does it happen? Well, here are the results. And I think the first thing you might notice, okay, so this is from below. This is the uh, uh, lateral view, medial view. Uh, first thing you notice is, oh my God, there's nothing in the visual areas, nothing. I don't know what that is, but really that is telling us that the visual areas are, uh, you know, collecting the data but they seem to have nothing to do with the percept. Of course, the data creates the percept, but the percept is not emerging here in the visual areas. Where is it? Well, it's up here. Here's the medial frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, and here's the lateral. So those are the main ones. There's a, uh, there's a few other structures, but clearly something's going on uh, principally in the frontal areas. So conscious perception of location is computed outside the visual cortex. Notice we only, we're not saying that perception, because we only tested location, that's a start. So perception occurs outside the visual cortex. And this all depended, this is all based on the point that attention did not project to the expected perceived locations in early, early visual cortex. This is the only way we were able to get this far because attention seems to be immune to this illusion. And therefore, it's not sort of alerting every uh, cortex to where the perceptive, perceived location is and not kind of um, uh, you know, corrupting our measures with uh, top-down stuff. And the top-down stuff we believe is going to the, um, the physical path because attention doesn't have the illusion. So attention like saccades may be independent uh, perception. So those are the conclusions for this second part. Uh, one is that conscious perception is outside the visual cortex. Now, lots of people are interested in the frontal cortex as a site of, of uh, conscious experience. And, and also, um, I think some of the more, re more the last um, uh, binocular rivalry studies um, also uh, favored the frontal cortex um, and, and others as well. So this is not the only uh, piece of evidence that the frontal cortex is the arbiter of perception. Um, but it was uh, not what we expected and not something particularly, um, I kind of like the idea that all neurons contribute to awareness, not some particular set in the front. Uh, nevertheless, the evidence here is that something is going on in the frontal cortex that underlies this perception of location. Now, it doesn't mean there has to be a map there for you, uh, those of us who like to think of location as some kind of map thing. I mean, location doesn't have to be a map. Uh, it could be like a feature, you know, uh, that uh, tennis ball is uh, kind of lime 
yellow, and, but it's also uh, up at five comma three location to the top right or something like that. You could think of, um, I mean, I, I'm just making that up. I don't know. I don't know how the frontal lobes code location, but it, it might not be the right idea to um, try and find maps there uh, that, that are part of this. Okay. Now, last section is about uh, what happens when your eyes move, um, except in, we're not going to actually have your eyes move, although that's our, our goal in, uh, in the end. We're going to, uh, it's going to simulate the effects of eye motions um, using frames, moving frames. And uh, what we're after is why does the world look steady when you move your eyes? So here's a typical summer cottage in uh, Ontario. Um, and if you were to move your eyes around this um, cozy spot, like I'm showing you here, if you move your eyes across those three, four, five spots, well, the, the cottage doesn't move. Um, but of course, on your, on your retina and the information that you bring, there's some major changes in location. And it's surprising we can put those all together. Well, not only do we put them all together, but uh, it, nothing seems to move. So that's the basic point of visual stability. And one um, so solution, one possible solution is the movement of the background across our retina. Again, motion comes to help, uh, helps, um, helps us stabilize the world. As you register that motion, and since it's the motion of every point on your retina, you can kind of subtract it. So that's a, um, a very uh, classic uh, uh, sort of proposal for visual stability. Uh, there we go. Uh, <clears throat> and that, that would say a position then is not location on the retina, but it's the position relative to a background. The background acts as kind of like an anchor. It's, it's the landmarks and the, where we see things depends on their location relative to that background. Uh, here's an example of someone leaving a train in Sweden. I don't know where it was, but anyway, she's waving there, as you can see. And she saw her wave. But she's waving up and down. But in fact, her, her hand motions traced out a sine wave, which you didn't see. And that's been part of the vision literature for a long time, almost a, a century there, uh, with Wallach and Johansson and you know, big names there, uh, moving frames. Okay, so what we've done is found that even a simple frame with no eye movements can give you some uh, major st stabilization of location. Um, it's in a way paradoxical. I'll show you where this is with Mark uh, Ozkan, Stuart Ansis, Mark uh, Wexler, and Marius Tahart. Okay, what we're going to do is just going to take a frame. Uh, this is web movie number five, uh, and it's going to move back and forth. And when it's at the its leftmost position, the left bar flashes blue. When it's at the rightmost position, oh, I got that backwards. When it's the leftmost position, the, its right bar flashes red. And when it moves all the way over to the right, the left bar flashes blue. So these, these two flashes are on the opposite sides of that frame. So they are separated in the, in the frame by the frame's width, of course. But on your retina, that's not at all the case. Nevertheless, what you will see as you run movie number five in a moment is pretty much the separation they have uh, in, in, in the frame as opposed to the world. And this is even true when you make the motion so far that the, the frames at the two endpoints don't even overlap. So the red bar is now physically to the left of the blue bar, and yet you'll still see the blue bar. Okay, so if you're ready for movie number five, I'm looking over here, I'm gonna start it. I think it stopped somehow. Okay, starting now, it starts very slow. So if you've started at the same time I have, it starts extremely slowly, and that's a, to allow you to see that the red bar is physically to the left of the blue bar. So the frame effect doesn't kick in until it gets a bit faster here, and you'll start all of a sudden to notice <clears throat> at a certain point. Well, you're not synchronizing me, so I don't know what point you're at, but at a certain speed, you say, hang on, I think the blue bar is the left of the red bar. And then these little markers in the top is what our subjects adjusted to report how wide they were. And then I turn the, I turn the background off every now and then so you can just be sure that, yeah, the red bar is to the left of the blue bar. And then it starts again very slowly. Okay, so that's the point. Oops, sorry, I clicked on the wrong screen. Um, back to the right screen, click. 
There we go. That was the movie you just saw, I hope. So what's going on here? So here's here are the data and what we're measuring here. So I'm gonna have to go back here and turn off my, uh, that movie was gone, okay. Um, you're measuring the inter edge spacing. What's the spacing between the left and right edge of the frame when you have flash one at one end of its motion and the other at the other end? And here are the data. So the, the, the subject's judgments, those two little bars you saw, uh, tell us what the inner edge spacing was. And positive means I saw blue to the left of red and negative, uh, Neil, sorry, wrong guy here. There we go. Negative means you saw red to the left of blue. So I have to go back there and turn that off. There we go, come back here. <clears throat> okay, now up here is the uh, frame size itself it was 12 and a half degrees. So it's a nice size frame. Um, and here are the data points along here, these five data points. Um, now, interestingly, when the frame is not moving at all, or pretty much not at all, you still don't see it quite as the frame size. So our, just, our, our, our matching technique sort of underestimates the frame size. We think we, we set the adjustments about 10, but that stays steady all, all the way across the different path lengths. So we're varying path length here. Here's the short path length. They don't really shift apart that much. Here's a long path length where they actually separate out. And this red line is the physical spacing of the uh, red and blue. And here it goes, it's gone negative, uh, red left of blue. Nevertheless, all the subjects, these are eight subjects, are reporting pretty much the same spacing as if the frame were not moving. And that is that uh, much of an illusion here. Oh, two, two exclamation marks again. This is a difference of uh, over 15, almost 20 degrees visual angle. Um, almost twice the size of the frame itself. So this is a major illusion. <clears throat> and it's paradoxical because even though you're seeing the red and the blue as separated by the, the frame width, as if the frame weren't moving, seen in frame coordinates, was stabilized, as if the frame weren't moving, as I said, um, but the frame is seen to be, I mean, um, we also measured how far you thought the frame moved and moved maybe 40 to 50% of, it was seen to move maybe 40 or 50% of what it actually was. Um, but it wasn't seen to move zero, it wasn't actually seen stationary at all. It was seen to move quite briskly and, and yet um, the positions were stabilized. Okay, well that was done by flashing the edges. Here's another example, web movie number six where we're gonna flash uh, spots in the middle of the frame, <clears throat> within the frame, uh, and the two spots are gonna be at the exact same location. Now this doesn't work for everyone. We found two people it doesn't work for, so we'll have a, we'll have a backup movie for you in a moment, or those two of you or whoever. Okay, so I'm starting it here, and I'm gonna start over here on my web version, movie number six. And for me anyways, those blue and the red are like far apart. They're like, oh, they're out there at the edges of that frame. And you turn the frame off so you can see that, in fact, they are superimposed. Or if you want, you can go stick your finger on one of them, and you'll see that the other one is, of course, exactly at the same location. And again, the top two dots are adjusted to get the data from the stimulus, from the subject. Okay, so the data there, uh, okay, uh, on the web version, you could skip ahead now to version number 6A where rather than having superimposed, they are uh, vertically separated. And now you'll see their separation as, a, as an angle. And this one, uh, as far as we know, everybody sees uh, without exception, and the, the, the data are the same. <clears throat> okay, so back to here. Uh, what happened? Well, they, they, they were superimposed, uh, but in the perception was that they were separated. How big is that shift? Well, the shift now, let me turn off my movie over here, which is annoying, there we go. Okay, the shift here, as we varied speed over a 64 fold variation of speed, the illusory shift was virtually always equal to the path length, no matter what the speed. That's very different from uh, like flash grab or flash lag or flash drag, all of which are speed dependent. This is not speed dependent. Uh, and then we even covered ranges of speeds that include the um, 
saccade speeds itself. So we know that this, this is operational within the range of speeds of eye movements. It didn't matter too much how big the frame was. Well, it come, kind of drifts off down here. I think because when the bigger frames start getting close to the uh, border of the monitor, it gives you additional, uh, additional um, uh, landmark. OK, so, so here, again, remember, the shift seems to be quite large, almost as big as the frame's motion. And here's the test of that. We vary the path length over which the frame moves and measure the illusory shift. And we do it two ways, one which the speed of the motion is the same, whether it's got a small path or a large path. So the duration would be very long for the large path up here. That would be the uh, constant speed. Those are the blue spots. Or constant duration. So uh, uh, the short paths would then take a long time, maybe slow. And the, um, uh, sorry, the, this is constant duration. So the short path is slow. And the, the long path is fast, so speed varies. So again, the speed doesn't matter. Constant speed, constant duration, same data. All show that the effect is pretty much linked to the path length. And then we repeated that with 141 subjects on an online version, where we're now looking at path length and illusory shift as a percentage of the frame width itself. And the data are very, very similar. OK, so shift depends on the path length and speed, but not speed, sorry, but not speed. Uh, what counts as a frame, you might ask. There's a, I've got shown you those nice little frames, but in fact, you can use a dot background. Now here's dots that are flashing. You can go to your web movie number seven now, I think. Yeah, and you'll see the, the dots come on. <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of them, and there's an offset. Um, uh, so it doesn't have to be a square. It has to be some um, landmarks. Uh, we found that when you use random dots where there's very few landmarks, uh, something else is happening. So in fact, we haven't finished those experiments. Okay, those two dots are always superimposed here, but you'll probably see an offset of maybe uh, one dot, one and a half dots. And it seems to be the same for whatever the number of background dots down to two for me, and one, it goes away. Uh, okay. Now, Okay, what, so that was the third part, conclusions. Okay, so we have motion comes to help again. Relative positions of tests flash before and after a frame appear stabilized. Well, why would that be interesting? Um, and it, well, it's kind of paradoxical, as we said, because the frame's not stabilized, doesn't stop moving, it seemed to move. Somehow the, the computation of position seems to be based on the frame um, and discounts its motion. So the locations experience the relative to the position in the frame. And we think this is part of uh, what happens when we move our eyes and the world seems steady. So we're just starting on this now. We're gonna um, make some links to uh, actual behavior comparing saccades to frames uh, to see what's present, what's common and, and what's different. And we're just starting. What well, we don't know yet, and we're also starting some uh, fMRI and EG. Uh, so we hope to get some answers, we, we don't know where this happens. Where does this frame relative position emerge? And can we do what we did with the uh, double drift and, and find out where it emerges? Uh, and a little bit more about what's the mechanism, how, how's the motion uh, you know, uh, acquired? And then is it applied to the whole visual field or local? Anyway, there's lots of questions left, left there, but I think you see that something interesting is happening here. Okay. So in conclusion, motion helps to position things. So motion was the original problem. You know, hang on, things are moving. My, um, you know, receptor field code is not is going to be out of date within a, a brief moment, uh, or my eyes are moving. All sorts of stuff are happening. Uh, well, motion plays a role here to help sort things out. It's really the great predictor. You know, if something is moving, we, the visual system has learned how to predict where it will be in a moment and, and operate on that predicted position. Uh, when the eyes are moving, uh, the, the brain has learned to take the background uh, displacements to help um, keep things where they are and not see them in motion. Okay, uh, so extrapolate position to overcome delays. We stabilize objects relative to frames. 
Uh, the middle case, the double drift was a little bit different. Uh, <clears throat> it wasn't so helpful in that case. It had gone, gone uh, uh, haywire and kept on uh, accumulating these drifts uh, beyond where it would be helpful and something that nevertheless was helpful to us to locate where conscious perception of um, location is. Okay, thank you. Oh, I should say that on your, um, your uh, demo movies, there are extras, um, which you can enjoy on your own. Uh, the web movie extra number one, uh, which I'm looking at now on the right here. So my eyes are aimed over there. Uh, actually has two simultaneous um, uh, frame effects going opposite directions at the same time. And that's uh, a clear way to eliminate an eye movement hypothesis that the, the real um, effect was um, uh, something about tracking with your eyes or something. So it's clearly not that. Um, it's clearly something about uh, using frames to recover position. So that was with uh, two frames. I think uh, next one was, Oh, just to show you what the original. You are not sharing the, the screen. Which web movie are you talking about? You're moving number yes. seven, uh, eight? Yes, um, I'm on web movie extra two. Extra two, yeah. I'm not okay. sharing the screen because of course yeah. it doesn't come across on the screen. That's right. Um, That's right. Extra one, we are at extra one, extra two, yes. Two extra two yes. Shows, uh, mm -hmm. shows, 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 lets us in on what happened here. This is a hundred years since Dunker did exactly this, moved a frame, uh, uh -huh. but he was moving a frame slowly across a, a static dot and mm -hmm. he could get an induced motion, very mm -hmm. small, but quite measurable. And there are maybe 50 or 60 articles on this, if not more, mm -hmm. um, but nothing really impressive happens until you flash the dot, absolutely mm -hmm. nothing. I mean, you can look at web movie extra Two, and you'll see mm -hmm. that, that static dot is just sitting there at the speeds we mm -hmm. were using for, for other um, experiments. It mm -hmm. just sits there. However, if you had flashed it, it would be like everything I showed you. It would be, uh, wow, you'd say, wow, look at us, a completely different location. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then I'll let you uh, look at the other ones if you wish. So the, the, the important one was the, the double yes. one you saw and the dunker one. Yeah, and then, yeah, and then yeah. some other things for your amusement and entertainment at, at a later date. Original okay. dunk effect. I see. This is really fantastic. In all the, these things, you know, in different papers, put them all together because when we mm. read one paper at a time, and now <laughs> we see the whole trajectory right. of thoughts going really fantastic. Right. Yeah. This right. Is so I guess we're done now. So we started out with illusions that were like five or ten percent of the mm. uh, inducer, and then uh, now mm. we're at Illusion is 100% of the inducer, so right. I, guess the, I guess my job is over. Uh, well, it's like when you, <laughs> you, you provide that. already some of the answers, we need to get the, 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 the more answers. So, Jingyu, do you like to fill the questions? And this is probably- Oh, sure, are there questions? I don't, yeah. I don't see in the chat, so you'll have to field questions for me. I'm not sure. Yeah, I've already seen uh, Xiaobin raising his hand, so um, maybe um, you can take the first question. Yeah, people can also you know, write in the chat, raise raise hand, and so on, yeah, to, to get our attention. The hosts are monitoring, yeah. Thanks, thanks. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't know much about the eye movement and it was great for me. I was curious, uh, given that you showed that, uh, I mean, we have kind of hierarchy also in, let, let's say, being aware of our eye movement in the brain. On the other side, there are also this hierarchy of, um, being aware of the perception in like vernacular library stuff. I was curious if you thought about any kind of parallels between these two in the brain. Um, well, they are possible, they're both possible, um, if I understand you correctly, both possible contributors to visual stability. So the awareness of the uh, eye movement, um, you know, plan, uh, efferent copy or co corollary, corollary discharge. Uh, are certainly, that's certainly one source of information about, hey, if the eyes are about to move, let's make some corrections. And, and I think there are some pretty good examples of showing that that must be a player, must be a contributor. The perceptual side, uh, which is uh, picking up all these signals about um, motion from the retinal uh, stimulus only, 
Um, I think what we're showing here is that they are, are you know, they are contenders. They have, they have real power to operate in the same speed range with the same uh, size of effect, 100%, um, as perhaps the um, efferents copy does. Um, whether both of them are required, um, so, so I don't, yeah, the, the whole processing path for the two is very different. And the, the time constants are very different. So they probably tease them apart, which is what we hope to do. Um, and uh, so I, I work with uh, Mark Wexler in Paris. And he thinks, oh, it's all retinal. Uh, efference copy is just, uh, you know, it's too slow. And, uh, and, but I, I think there's some examples of efference copy, uh, you know, which are pretty puzzling. And if it's not the case, uh, you know, the eye movement, uh, the after images move with your eyes. Um, they're not steady. Uh, although some people say if you have a complex enough after image, it doesn't. Anyways, there's some, a lot of interesting things you track down there. I think that's kind of our future work. Thank you. Uh, so could I ask a question to you? Yeah. Sure. sure. Yeah, OK. Yes. So there's one thing you're talking about, attention like saccades. Uh, uh, so you say like saccades. It is not always, do you mean that it's not always attention is the saccade? Yeah, we know, especially certain illusions do not uh, occur in V1, and then sometimes, they, yeah. So so do you want to qualify, for, for instance, also the evidence copy, we're not always aware of, of a saccade also. Yeah, maybe. Uh, right, there's, there's lots of uh, saccades of um, fixation, uh, sort of uh, eye movements of fixation. Mm -hmm. Which most of us claim we don't, we aren't making, but of course, if, if, if you have the eye movement equipment, you sh you can show someone how much their eyes are moving when they claim to be fixating. I think what's happening when you fixate and believe you're fixating is you click uh, an intentional landmark, and you have your attention fixed on that, and your attention is kind of compensating for the local eye movement, which is small, and, mm -hmm. and ma make you feel that you've got the uh, your eye on the ball all the time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think attention is part of where we think we are looking. I think it's separate from what your question was. Mm -hmm. um, I think the part of your question is some of these illusions do engage attention and therefore we do see them in fMRI in early cortex. Um, and we can see them in early cortex, even though we can show that the stimulus is not shifting on early cortex. So that was a very nice, uh, two examples of that, but one of them was from Ge, Zhang, Wang, and uh, He. I may have missed one or two, um, where they did uh, fMRI on 7T on the uh, flash grab one, that same one with the disc and the tilting mm -hmm. line. And they found, um, so they did find uh, tilt, they found evidence of tilt in V1 but they found it principally on the upper uh, layers because they could mm -hmm. separate the layers with 70. And mm -hmm. so their, their claim was the tilt was the downward projections and that the early mm -hmm. layers ha had much less if any tilt showing up. Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, so that's a problem for all you know, experiments on brain processing is that attention, um, what we might call attention has, has, is very clever and figures out what the, the expected target is and, and puts the activity at the expected location. Mm -hmm. And so now we're left with saying, well, hang on, is this activity reflecting bottom up or top down? Mm -hmm. and, and you have to be very careful if you want to say which is which. So mm -hmm. I think we were, we were exceptionally uh, lucky in finding this one illusion, the double drift, which appears mm -hmm. to be, where attention appears to be immune to the illusion. I mean, that's, we know of no other case where this is true. And this mm -hmm. was really a, a, an opportunity to, to track the bottom-up signal when it doesn't change through many layers in the hierarchy. And then boom, mm -hmm. it does change, but boom, it was outside the visual system. So that was, that was totally unexpected. And, uh, and there you go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So perhaps distinguishing bottom-up and top-down, especially when you're instructing the subject to saccade to this location and the saccade is not susceptible to illusion. In yeah. this case, because the, the screen is blank, there's only more or less one location. So therefore it's actually completely using the bottom, bottom up attention to saccade. It doesn't even need to recognize any objects or any faces or any illusory uh, positional change. 
So, right. and the top down attention internet saying, well, your eye is fixating your eye, uh, your attention is fixating, your eye is not fixating. So you feel as if your eye is fixating, but actually it's your top down attention is fixating, your bottom up eye is not. Uh, yeah, it gets uh, not confusing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's like o online, online um, uh, difference between the uh, uncon what we'd call unconscious, what the saccade is going to go to, and the conscious percept. And, and yet, you know, when you make the saccade to this target, mm -hmm. you think, okay, well, I got there, I landed on it, you know, it's any, nothing special here. Uh, mm -hmm. But in fact, the thing is, you did land on it, mm -hmm. as opposed to landing on the perceived location, which would have been quite far away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Okay, I think we may take the one last question. Okay, um, sorry, we've gone over time. Um, so uh, I saw one question in the uh, chat window. Uh, oh, so here you go. Would you like to unmute yourself? And oh, crowding. Oh, I love crowding. Yes, crowding is one of the most uh, fascinating phenomena. So the whole periphery suffers under this effect of clutter so that um, if any couple of few things are nearby, uh, you really don't get to recognize what's there. Mm -hmm. um, now we can't do crowding experiments on the double drift because it doesn't like other stimuli near, near it. That, that really gives it other reference points and the effect goes away. Uh, we have tried crowding with the flash grab, but basically when we put, any, when we put anything close enough to the flash, and let's say that here's the moving band of stuff and we put the flash in it and it gets dragged. Now, if we put two things outside of them, well, what happens is that they all get dragged together. So we, we haven't any, had, had any success using crowding to kind of pull these different things apart. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think crowding, to, to me, crowding is really tied in with attention. That crowding is sort of a, a failure of attention to isolate a target. Um, so, well, I could talk on other things for on crowding for a long time because it is it's a fascinating area, but I don't really have any insights that it gives here that I've seen yet. And you might have something. Okay, um, Peter, please ask your question. Yeah, Patrick. Um, oh, um, Peter, two yes. questions. Uh, yeah, hi. First of all, hi. Uh, a short one and perhaps a longer one. The first one is when you uh, explored the, the double drift illusion, did you have a chance to look at the role of eccentricity when I read this paper? Yes. Uh, I wondered uh, if uh, this matters. I mean, intuitively, I would expect it to matter, uh, not, <laughs> not really being able to, uh, to figure out uh, why. Yes, absolutely. That's uh, the, the first short question. And, and the other one, I mean, uh, when you talk about uh, extrapolating visual information to the future. Um, uh, uh, don't you have to, to have exact knowledge of the, the exact visual latency? And that depends on the number of factors, uh, something like uh, general luminance and uh, so on and so forth. So how is uh, this uh, taken into account? Uh, okay, so for, first question. Oh, I forgot the first question already. Hang on. Oh, eccentricity, yes. I have a very short memory. All right, eccentricity. So with the examples I showed you, the, the Gabor was uh, um, you know, eight, well, in our experiments, it was about eight degrees eccentric. And um, of course, if you then foveate it, there's no illusion. So in that sense, it's um, dependent on the eccentricity, but in fact, it scales. So that if I showed you the illusion uh, on a screen, a monitor screen, and I asked you now to walk back 40 meters, <laughs> that'd be a long way, um, you get the same illusion. Now it's a much, then it's a much tinier uh, Gabor and it's much closer to the fovea, but if you're good at keeping your fixation on that fixation spot, you will have the same. Um, uh, and also uh, this is Guernsey and Bayard did exactly this experiment and showed that the illusion strength is constant as long as you scale the size and the path length with eccentricity. So it, the idea is behind it is that the illusion comes out because the position information is poor. It has to be equiluminant, it has to be a board that's equiluminant with its background. Mm -hmm. And because its position information is poor, uh, the motion signals are now uh, major contributors to predicting or to constructing its location. So uh, if you 
took away the gray background, made a black background, then, then you got very good position information and the motion signals have no effect anymore. If you make it equiluminous, motion signals start to contribute. And the motion signal is interestingly, a uh, sum of those two um, vectors, the, the, the motion of the Gabor itself and the internal motion. And that's what is moving the stimulus along its illusory path. Um, so that happens as long as the position information is poor. So if it's very tiny in the other phobia, it's, it's about the same as it's very big in, in the periphery. So it's about position uncertainty uh, and, and uh, mm -hmm. not particularly about eccentricity. Now, the other one you asked about, uh, hang on, that was- um, well, Visual latency, uh, that, uh, that latency, is not constant, right, right, right. Uh, it changes. Okay. Yes, so the prediction depends on a latency measure. And in fact, if you do uh, the experiment you mentioned, and, and maybe you, you're remembering that, I don't think you were an author, I can't remember. If you do change the, the luminance level, uh, you don't change the uh, flash grab thing, that initial one with the bars. They, they are not uh, changed by um, luminance. And, th and that was an argument against the extrapolation model originally. However, my argument would be, and we haven't followed this up, so this would be a possibility, is that saccades also uh, don't uh, get affected much by the illumination uh, luminance level of the target. And so the point is that the saccade system is what's making this extrapolation. And yes, you can do, you can mess up the, the latency by changing the luminance. I suppose if you did it for a month at a time, you'd probably compensate and calibrate. But let's say, I'm just doing it briefly at a, a very low luminance. Um, the, uh, the, the illusions in this case are not reduced by, are not increased by as much as you'd expect by the longer latency at low luminance. But my claim is that saccades also uh, would not be affected by the luminance change very much. And, and, the, and that the saccade error and the perceived error would continue to be correlated. Uh, we did do the experiment across subjects to show that the uh, subject latency, uh, which includes a lot of different things in the saccade latency, but that latency was correlated to the perceptual error. So in some, in some ways, the the latency is taken into account, but probably not on a sort of trial by trial basis. I mean, that might be asking. Well, that's a whole area of research that could be fascinating on what time constant does the latency measure start to influence the percept or the saccade or both. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for uh, your wonderful talk. And, uh, okay, thank you. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. Uh, but unfortunately, we are already beyond time, so uh, right. we cannot uh, take more questions now. So, um, um, so uh, then we will um, go into the individual meetings, and, uh, and now it's um, my meeting um, at first, yeah. and then. Yeah. Okay. So, so thank you very much. Really uh, appreciate. It. it looks like we need to have you come back and do the follow up things, maybe on a crowding or maybe next time hopefully physically come back as well as oh, that, possibly. Yeah. that would be lovely that, that would, would be, be great yeah. yeah thank you so much it's in a crowding and lots of questions like to follow up thank you very okay. much yeah thank you yeah